I agree with you. It's a very good film. Um, I'm Stacy Wilson-Hunt from New York Magazine, and I'm very honored and pleased to be here to introduce Ethan Hawke. To get that from you means so much. Really, really, thank you. I've done a lot of these, and I've never seen a standing ovation well, that's here. So funky. that's neither have I. Very impressive. Very deserved, by the way. Um, so before we dive into Born to Be Blue, which is such a stunning film on so many levels, um, I wanted to know when and how you decided that you wanted to act. Well, um, that surprised me. Um, <laughs> That's why I'm uh, here. Yeah, well, how I wanted to act. Um, you know, there were there's several moments. Uh, a lot of young people love to perform, and so there are many times that I think where I had the desire, but it was kind of, uh, you know, not, not a out of the ordinary. I went, there was the Paul Robeson Center for Performing Arts in um, Princeton, New Jersey, and I didn't have a winter sport, and my mother signed me up at the Paul Robeson Center for Performing Arts, and I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I went in there, and I learned about Paul Robeson, and for those of you who don't know, a guy was incredible, and he's an amazing first role model as an actor, as a guy who, um, who did so much. I mean, he's just a great singer and, um, and an actor and an activist and uh, a thinker and a writer, uh, an amazing person and an athlete for that matter. Um, and we were doing, the head of the McCarter Theater came in to do an improv workshop. And after it was over, he came up to me and asked me, um, if I enjoyed it, and I said I did, and he said, would you like to be in a play? We're doing um, George Bernard Shaw's St. Joan. And how old were you at this point? Um, I'm 12. Okay. And, um, <laughs> That's heavy material for a 12 year old. Yeah, and I was like, I didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, it, it, <laughs> my son once said, I just thought of this funny thing. My, my, my son once said, um, this is gonna make sense in a second, but he said, Dad, what are the Academy Awards? You know? And I said, oh, it's this award they give for movie acting and stuff. He goes, oh, I bet Scooby-Doo has a lot. <laughs> and I was like, That's very I, sweet. I, I said, I don't know if Scooby has any. Actually, he would be an Emmy, not an Oscar. Yeah, well, I didn't see any details. <laughs> anyway, but the point being is, I, I, he, they could have been talking about Scooby-Doo. I had no idea who George Bernard Shaw was or anything. And, um, but I did this play and I was holding this, the, you know, I was Dunois page holding a lance and everything. And, and um, it was so much fun to listen to the actors rehearse. And I listened to my own parents around the dinner table and they hated their jobs so much. And all they did is, life started when work ended. And I was sitting in there in this rehearsal room and they were talking about issues of faith and issues of war and issues of time and what Shaw meant about this. And I just couldn't believe this was a job, you know, I, like that you could just sit around and talk about. And then you got to perform and people came, you got to wear this knight's costume and I had chainmail armor. I was like, this is, I love this job. And, um, and so uh, that was the start. And then I, through a friend of a friend, found out about some auditions in New York, and so I started going on open calls. And how did you get cast in Voyagers? Explorers. Explorers, get excuse that. me, right. Explorers. Okay. <laughs> Explorers. How did I get, I, I went on these open calls, and they, Joe Dante had just directed Gremlins, which was oh, a big right. hit, and this yes. was a $30 million movie in 1984, which was huge, and they were doing casting calls throughout the country, and um, I, I started going on these auditions, and I got called back, and I got called back, and finally... This is in New York at the time. Well, I was living in New Jersey, oh, okay. and, but I would take the train in. And my mother let me go as long as it didn't cost her anything, so I had to pay for the train, <laughs> and I didn't have a headshot. My buddy Brandon would do a Polaroid, you know? And I'd do a Polaroid and put it on there, and I went on an audition, and I got all these callbacks. And then finally, uh, they, I got called back for the screen test and I, you know they do that thing which is they make you sign it was very weird to us I, i'd never had it my mother was just what is it they handed her a deal memo and we're gonna fly to los angeles and i had to sign this whole thing and uh and my 
mother didn't want to tell me. I remember I was eavesdropping because my <laughs> stepfather and she were fighting about whether to tell me I'd gotten this final callback. Because if I got the part, she never occurred to her that I would get a part. But she's like, well, listen, if he gets a part, who's going to go with him to L.A.? I right. mean, there were nobody. And was River and, cast at this point? Was no, there, no. So everyone I met River at the screen test. Um, oh, wow. We went in, and it was right around here. Um, we tested. It was all these, all these young kids, and um, uh, more than one of whom are, are deceased now, too. So be wow. warned about child acting, you know? Um, it's really, really uh, has to be done just right. You have to right. have good people on your yeah, side, it's, too. It's really tough. But, uh, yeah, my mom, we stayed at the Holiday Inn, and I remember, uh, like, eating on the roof with um, Peter Billingsley. You remember him from oh, A Christmas course. Story, right? <laughs> well, he auditioned, too, and he was a really nice kid. And I, he, in my mind, he was a huge this star. Is, he was Ralphie. Like, I, I, I just couldn't believe I was having dinner with him. He had Peter already Billingsley. done Ralphie at this point. He'd done he Christmas did, Story. That's all I yeah. cared about when he yeah. got his tongue stuck to the thing. And I was like, I was like, dude, you are amazing. It's in interesting. That movie. that movie was like did not do well. And well, it was I a cult it. classic, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I was hip to it early. And, um, and anyway, poor Peter didn't get the part. River got it. Um, but I remember um, my mother was so worried I was going to be disappointed that, you know, if I didn't get it. She, she kind of thought it was a lose-lose situation. I remember like, because if I got the part, who was going to go with me to L.A.? What were we going to do about school? What does, like... She just never thought it would get this far, right. you know? And then if I didn't get the part, what was that gonna do to my self-esteem, you know? I was so young and I was getting so into it. Um, and, uh, but I, I got the part. Yes, we know. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. But you know, and it's hard, it's, it's funny to talk about River, you know, I think for obvious reasons watching this, because first of all, it's, it's still hard for me not to think about how great he would have been in a role like this. Um, how wonderful it would have been to get to see, uh, you know, more performances and to get to see what his what he would have done and accomplished as an adult, um, and how tough it is to um, for all of us, you know, for the ways in which people try to navigate the incredibly rocky terrain of our own well, emotional. How did, how did you do it? Because you you did make it out and have thrived. Um, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I don't know well, what You made the, good choices along the way. You made good you. choices. Well, one of them was not to shoot heroin. That is. All right. And, and it's funny. I have a 17-year-old daughter who's really falling in love with acting. You know, she's really falling in love with it hard. And the one thing that just keeps going through my mind is that if you look at, like, the history of, you know, if there was a big book full of all the people who wanted to have a substantive life in the arts. And, and you go through all the people who didn't, who didn't achieve their, live up to what they wanted for themselves, whatever that was, right? And if you, if, if you put all those people on a list, and then you, or if you took off everybody that self-destructed, you'd be left with very few people. You know, very few people that self-destruction if you can just say, all I'm going to do is not self-destruct, your chances of achieving what you want go up exponentially. And also ask for help if you need it early on. Well, yeah, that seems but, to you know. The, but artists, artists like to live in their own heads. Well, sometimes. and people like to, I mean, people, not just artists, everybody, you know, I mean, it's, it's, artists tend to do it with a particular flair. Um, but, uh, but the whole nation and the whole world struggles with drugs and alcohol. I mean, you know, people are navigating their own insecurity, their own pain, their own disappointment. But it, um, I, be my biggest, I remember Robin Williams once telling me that, you know, he thought that the coke made him funny. He didn't realize that he was funny despite the coke. That the coke was in a lot of the, the drugs can be a metaphor of all the things we do to lacerate ourselves. We a lot of us impede ourselves. I don't know what we're afraid of, but like it's because it, if I now I can just deal with this implement I put in front of myself, so I don't have to deal with the larger questions of am I talented? Do I have something to offer? Does the art form have something to offer? Why am I living? Why am I dying? You know, the, the questions that really cause anxiety, um, but. It, the, you end up just making it harder for yourself. 
Well, we're glad you made it out I'm and survived. Um, I wish we had more time to go through. I have to say, um, a seminal movie for me as a young person was Reality Bites, and I want to ask you so many questions about it, but we don't have time. Um, <laughs> and your character, Troy, became the archetype for every guy I did not want to date after that, moving forward. So thank you for that. Thank you well, for that. Well, I'm glad to teach you that <laughs> valuable lesson about who not to date. A lot, of, I, a lot for, of ladies learned for, for, who not to like after that. For the interest of this period and how it kind of relates, can I tell one Reality Bites story? Okay, fine, sure. I love it. Okay, so when I was in high school, I, um, I, I struggled with my grades, and to try to pull my grade point average up, um, I would try to do really well in English. Like, if I could just get, like, an A in English, it would pull some of the other things up. And I got... I, got, I was getting a B in English, and I went up, this is my junior year of high school, and I, I went up to my teacher, and I, they, everybody had to recite a poem in front of the class. You know, everybody's doing, tiger, tiger, burning bright, like a fountain in the night, right? And I said to my teacher, I said, listen, if I, like, really do this, like, really well, not like, okay, but like, really well, will you kick it up a notch? You know, and they said, you said sure, what's really well? I said, just trust me, right? And... <laughs> So I memorized all of Gregory Corso's Marriage. It's a poem. It's about three and a half pages long or something like that. It's very long. And, you know, should I get married? Should I be good? Astound the girl next door with my velvet suit and my Faustus hood, not take her to movies, but to cemeteries and tell her of werewolf tongues and four clarinets and desire her and kiss her and all the preliminaries. And she going just so far. And I understanding why, not getting angry, saying you must feel. It's beautiful to feel. And then I take her and I lean her against an old crooked tombstone the entire night, the constellations in the sky, right? That's the first start. And I nailed this thing. But it's, it goes on on and on, right? I mean, it goes on and on and on. And, and it, the class loved it, and it was great. But it stuck in my head, right? And so we're doing these improvisations on Reality Bites for Winona was supposed to be making her like little video document of what really was becoming reality TV, right? And, um, and so I started, I was goofing around the guitar and I started doing that poem. You know, because let's face it, I was like five years out of high school when I did that thing. So it was fresher in my mind than it is now. And then I saw the final cut of the movie, and Bennett put it in the movie. And it's just in the background, I'm reciting this thing. It sounds kind of like a blues song, the way I'm doing it. But it's like, I was like, Ben, this is, I didn't write that. Like, this is a famous poem. <laughs> like, we need permission for this. He's like, what do you mean? I, the picture's locked. And, and, and I, I, I was like, well, but, 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 but you know, you, Gregory Corso wrote that poem. Well, lo and behold, one day, I was walking down the streets of New York, and um, Gregory Corso comes up to me, like with tears in his eyes. He's like, he's like, you are an angel. I said, what do you mean? He goes, no, an angel from God. He said, I was a pauper, and he got a check in the mail for seventeen thousand dollars from Reality Bites. Yeah? And um, and 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 I know, I know, it's like amazing. And he's like, you saved my life. And I said, well, thank my high school English teacher. So don't drop out of high school is the lesson learned here. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Um, and your work in the early 90s also elicited uh, one of your most important collaborations and collaborators, Richard Linklater, with whom you worked uh, on the before movies. I'll just call them the before movies and, of course, Boyhood. Um, I was interested to learn that you and Richard had actually tried to make a Chet Baker movie about 15 years ago. And how, how did you initially get attracted to his story, but also what happened with that film that it didn't go. Well, we all know that, I mean, you know, so many projects don't, you know, Plans of Mice and Men and everything. And um, the truth is that Brad Pitt was doing a Chet Baker movie. Mm -hmm. And I got a call saying Brad Pitt just dropped out. And would it's you want to It's always good to hear, actually. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> I'm in, coach. Put me in. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Remember one time my, my agent said to me, the only difference between you and Brad Pitt is a gym. <laughs> so like how little they think of actors, really. You know? <laughs> and did you say, have you seen Training Day? Mm, I mean, no. you were pretty fit in that one. No. <laughs> uh, and anyway, the point is, so I, I called R Linkletter up. We had done Before Sunrise up. And I said, they, are, they want me to do this biopic um, of Chet Baker. And the way, I'll share this with you just because it's a testament to what an interesting person Richard Linkletter is. He's like, well, huh, what's interesting about Chet Baker? Chet Baker is cool. Chet Baker is cool. What is cool? 
Cool <laughs> is detachment. Detachment. You, Chet Baker doesn't seem to care about anything. Detachment is both a positive and a negative. Because if you're detached, then you're liberated from desire. But if you're too detached, you're not connected and take no responsibility for your actions. It's going to be a movie about what it means to be cool. And it's going to be about the 50s. And it's about how America thought it was cool. It's going to be a movie about Chet Baker the day before he tries heroin. A day in the life. This was his idea. He was like, and it was a great idea. And we worked at this play. We did a script, and it all follows him just the day of, that he sees, the first time he sees the William Claxton photos and starts to see himself in the third person. It was kind of an idea of, of how America was beginning to, was post-war and kind of believing it was important and how that's the first step, you know, when you lose your humility, you know, that, that you, you lose reality and that you stop living in the truth and that it was, you were gonna see the drugs all around him, but it was gonna be a moment just to stay in his life of where he starts to believe his own shit. Now, it was really cool, except we just couldn't get the money made for it. And uh, I mean, we couldn't get the money to make it. And a couple years went by and um, we were sitting like, you know, at a hotel pool or something. And, and I said, God, you know, maybe if we just go to New Line, maybe they'll give us some money. And Rick's like, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that project. I was like, what? He goes, well, by the time Chet was 31, which is how old you are, he was definitely a junkie. You don't look 25 anymore. And I'm like, I'm out, coach. That's what you're saying. You're saying I'm out. It's like, I'm saying you're out. And I was like, oh, he's my best friend, too. You know, he's like, look, man, you're too old for this part. Like, it's, it's a movie about youth and about, he's like, we've just taken too long. We got to move on. And I was like, damn. And I'd, I'd read all these books and listened to it. And he was right. I was too old for it. But um, it, it stuck in me, you know. I was really disappointed about it. And the script was great. Not good, great. And, um, and Richard had written the script too? No, Stephen Belber had written the script. And Stephen Belber wrote a movie we did do called Tape. Um, he's a brilliant writer. And really, it was a really cool script. Well, anyway, cut to 12, 15 years later, I get a, another script that opens up. And it's, oh, here's Chet Baker again. Wow. And I felt like it was, I was reading the sequel to a film I never made. You know? <laughs> And I was kind of hypnotized by it, and I felt really close to this character, but having prepped it, and I imagined, you know, it's really interesting. And, and I found that this moment in his life was actually a lot more interesting from the actor point of view. I mean, he's, he's so vulnerable and so uh, broken. In a lot of ways, that's a lot more interesting than the rise to right. acclaim, you know? Um, and so, uh, it seemed like it was calling me a little bit. And what scared you the most about taking on this character at this time in his life? Well, the, there's a physical thing that scared me the most, which was the fact, were they serious that they wanted me to try to sing? <laughs> like, you know, like that was, I kept, as we were talking about whether to do the movie, I was like, well, how do we handle the singing? <laughs> you know, because I, I, if I, there was a riddle attached to it, because if you actually play Chet Baker and then all of a sudden have me lip sync, and it's, it's not the same voice right. as the person who was acting the whole movie. Right. And I had this belief, there's a great jazz critic that says that Chet Baker doesn't actually sing, it's more the memory of someone singing. Mm -hmm. And he does have this quality in some of his best pieces that you aren't sure if he's going to like live through the song <laughs> and and I actually thought you know I could kind of act that that's he he he's not a great singer the way Billie Holiday is a great singer the way Ella Fitzgerald is a great singer but he does communicate emotion I mean I even put that we put this in the script to have Dizzy say to him you know you, you got to stop the singing you know because the, the real jazz guys were always telling him that right. but what they didn't totally understand is how insecure he was about his embouchure, mm. and he, he really liked to sing to give his mouth a break. Mm. Even before he got beat up, you know, he was missing a tooth, before he always had a really weak embouchure, in his mind anyway. Mm. Um, 
uh, and then when he lost his teeth, he really had a weak arm, sure. But, but it, was, it was almost like you know, he projected the fear that he created it in a way. Hmm. Um, but anyway, that was the, the, the singing was the scariest part. Um, and also, if you love jazz, the idea of making a bad jazz movie, I, I mean, I could just see the bad, you know, the beatnik black turtlenecks <laughs> and the cigarettes, you know, all those terrible jazz yeah. movies, you know. Um, but I decided to take a swing. And so how much of the trumpet playing is you? You know all the parts where he's playing terribly? <laughs> like when he's learning? I did all those great. I mean, that was hard. Um, no, um, mm -hmm. what I did is I, was, I had to learn about 10 songs, eight songs. Um, and what I would do is I would put a damper on it. So it would, and I would crank up the music really loud. And I'd really just play along with the mm -hmm. real music. Okay. Um, you're uh, musical there's, otherwise. You there's a couple guitar. scenes where he, yeah, and there's a couple yeah. scenes where he's like practicing and stuff like that. And um, summertime was my best. But that, mm -hmm. um, the guy, there's a great trumpeter from Montreal whose name is escaping me right now, who did all the playing, and it, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And he was really receptive. It was really wonderful. I, I could, you know, write him these emails and say, hey, do you think I feel like that solo needs to be sadder? Like there was a, a couple beats where I knew what I wanted to be playing. Mm -hmm. And they, they were too exciting, particularly in the last number, you know, that, with that solo. And he was great, yeah, you're right, okay, cool. But he'd never, you know, he'd, he'd never recorded anything for other than the purpose of how it sounded. He wasn't thinking about how it was going to be like to act it out. Hmm. Um, so that was fun. Well, it looks very convincing. So oh, that's very the well idea. Done. Yes, very well done. Um, you mentioned earlier your agent telling you the Brad Pitt thing, which is very funny. Um, Someone like you who isn't just an actor, you've written plays, books, you've directed movies, you sort of are the consummate renaissance man to use a cliche, but it fits. How do you navigate the business side of Hollywood when you aren't just one thing? Because your team wants you to just, just be a guy, just be an action star, just be an indie guy. How do you convince them that, then you have a book coming out this year, I hear. How do you convince them that this next project is, makes sense and it's smart and it's worthwhile? At this point, they've gotten a little used to me, but it was a lot harder when I was younger. You know, there was a great interview with Al Pacino that I read once, and, and he said that, remember that agents and anybody like that, they don't actually have to play the part, and only you know if you have an idea or if you don't, or, and you, just because something might even go badly doesn't mean it's not a good idea. You know, like, um, I, as the older I get, the more I think about this. You know, I, I did, I, I was really moved by Steppenwolf. When I, when I saw, and as a kid, they did True West with Malkovich and Sinise, and I saw their production of Grapes of Wrath, and I was really moved by them. And they asked me if I would do um, Buried Child for the 25th anniversary of Steppenwolf in Chicago. And I said yes, and my agents at the time were like, you don't, you don't want to go to Chicago for six months and do that play. And I was like, where else would I want to be? Like, this is my favorite theater company in America, and they're inviting me to, to work with my favorite playwright. I mean, what do you, where else should I be? And they're like, all right, go ahead and do it. And so here's the thing, and so I think I'm doing great, and I'm working hard, and I'm learning these lines. And I just got, just couldn't find a decent review, right? It just, I just got my ass handed to me. Nobody liked me in this play. Ironically, they loved the play. It was the worst case scenario, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, you know, I always knew, like, my name was coming up when the paragraph started. Unfortunately... Oh shit! Here I come, um, you know. And uh, and and how long ago was this? What year? I was, was this? about twenty-five. Okay. And um, but here's the funny thing: is then later I did another Shepherd play, and everybody loved it. And it's not like I shouldn't have done the one, and I should have done the other. I would have never been good in the other one if I hadn't done that. And only I in here can know if I'm developing or not. And I'm not really in charge of what anybody else thinks. I'm in charge of my development, right? And, and so it's one of the things I love about this movie when I read the script. One of the things that I thought was I hadn't actually seen before, which is an ending of a movie where somebody is having an intense professional triumph simultaneously with a catastrophic personal failure. And you know, that's the way life works. I mean, not always like, where nothing is one thing. You know, you, we all want something, oh, this is gonna be good. Well, it might be good. But if you handle it the wrong way, my mother made this thing for me 
that she, it would be in my like act like it's I had it in my fridge for years it's a really sweet thing now that I'm older I can't believe she did it but I was really struggling for a period of time after Dead Poets Society and uh, before Reality Bites it's like four years of a lot of auditions and I just I thought that things were going to be going better and be easier and I'd call her up I was like I just don't know I'd screen tested for some part and I don't know if I'm going to get the part and, and she sent me in the mail a graph it starts like today is today and there's this like little box and in this scenario you get the part and in this scenario you don't get the part right and it followed down all the different scenarios and they all ended with handle it well be happy handle it poorly be miserable right you, you know it's like any scenario you go down has a positive and a negative you know and you know the guy the man's just right you know if he's not you know this and apparently there's some truth in this. Dizzy says to him, he doesn't want to give him the gig, not because he's not ready to play, it's because his mind's not ready. You know? And he wants it so bad, he wants it so bad. And we're all like that. I want, even though you, not having any kind of trust about when, you know, the universe speaks to us about when we're really ready, and he wasn't ready, you know, um, in this scenario, in this story. And so, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the question was. <laughs> I don't either, but it was totally fine. I find the best answers come from questions that they forget about. Um, who or what most inspires you now um, as a writer, as a director, as an actor? Um, I say this because of the room that we're in, but um, anytime, whenever I'm doing a play, I, uh, and it's like a Wednesday matinee and you really don't want to do it. I would, play a, I would play a game with myself and I'd really trick myself that Phil Seymour Hoffman was coming. You know? That, um, is that Phil's got there. So you better do your best. You know? And, cause, uh, and I would think, I thought a lot about him with this movie. Um, you know? And, you know, he had kind of a, for, I used to have this picture on my wall, I would never have told him this, but I had it on my desk, it was a picture of him in the New York Times that had a profile on him, and it said, portrait of an actor as an artist. It's a close up of him, and you know, it's strange, if, if you look at it now, he looks so unhappy. You know, he looks so unhappy, and funny, at the time, I thought he looked so cool, he looked so deep, you know? And I, I used to put that on my, because as I would read scripts and think about what to do, I would think about what would Phil do, you know, what would Phil, what would Phil say about that. You know, Denzel is ferocious too. You know, Denzel uh, has accomplished the impossible. I mean, to be a dramatic actor and a movie star in this day and age and perform at the level that he has, and he has the obstacle of race. And he consistently does good work. And, and, and I mean, I, I so that, that's amazing. Th those people inspire me. You know, Denzel, when I was working on the, um, the trumpet playing, if you watch Mo Better Blues, oh, you don't know how hard that is until you try to do it. <laughs> like, and I know, like, I know him well enough to know that he just put in the time. It's just about the hours, you know. Um, and um, so certain people inspire me. Um, and it is so, I don't know. I, Sometimes I'll go see, I see a play the other day with Austin Pendleton in it, and I get so moved by um, actors who fight the good fight their whole life and don't have a lot of those superficial praises and things like that, but give it all, all the time. It's so beautiful to see. I remember even, um, I remember uh, hearing an interview, one of these kind of Q&As with actually Quentin Tarantino just popped into my brain and somebody's talking about how good he was at discovering like forgotten actors and why don't you do this one or this one and, and he had the best answer, he said, because they're not any good. <laughs> it's like, you, you, like, I liked, he was talking about Carradine, David Carradine, he's saying, you know, you know how hard it is to be good on a guest spot of, um, um, you know, the... 200th episode of MASH and appear and then like really deliver something good or MacGyver, you know how hard it is to be good at MacGyver? You know, that's, these, he's like, those are the people I love. Not just, it's not, he's not interesting because he's some washed up star, you know. Travolta is a great actor. The world had forgotten about him. He's a great actor. Um, 
And so, in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of people like that, you know, who constantly are doing good work everywhere they get the opportunity to. And I find that really inspiring. That's what made Phil special, you know, is that Phil was a character actor, and for years, we had a very opposite trajectory. When we worked together on Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, I had been given leads since the time I was 18 years old. Phil had to fight for a lead. Like, he was always playing the second cop to the right, and he would try to figure out who that cop was and how this cop could contribute to the larger story. So he would never leave a line unmined. You know, like, when you were, I would always say, this seems, yeah, this seems good. I'm really worried about the next one. He's like, no, no, no. Why do you say that? Uh, I don't know. Why? Well, it's clear that you don't know. I mean, it's, uh, one thing's for sure is that you don't know. But I know why I'm saying it. It makes me feel weird that you don't know why you're saying what you're saying. Because, <laughs> hey, listen. Um, I could totally picture him saying yeah, that, too. I can, too. <laughs> There's, I have to, now I'm on down the rabbit hole with him a little bit. There's, we had to do the scene in, in Before the Numbers of where we're sitting kind of like this. And we're like, and, you know, we know Sydney wants to play it in, in one. We're just sitting there. And we have these lines back and forth, back and forth. And, and um, all of a sudden, there's a huge pause. And you hear from... Um, Sydney, uh, who, whose line is it? Whose line is it? What's happening? Whose line is it? And, and I said, uh, well, Phil, it's you. Said, no, it's not, not my line. Ethan gave me the wrong cue. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, I have an idea, and if you give me the wrong cue, I can't do it. <laughs> like, for example, like if the, the, the line was, well, it's a good day, isn't it? And I said, well, it's a good day, but I didn't do the isn't it. And he had this idea of, no, it is not. You know, and, and finally I was like, so wait, what is the line? You, you're, you're leaving out the isn't it. And we all know he's going to play it in one. And if I do a good job, would you give me the wrong cue? I won't get to do what I want to do. And I was like, all right, it's a good day, isn't it? It is not. You know, and it was like, that's like, it was like, okay, dude, I'll give you your cue. I think of people who are merciless like that, you know? Well, but he, he's someone who most represents someone who loved the craft. He didn't want the fame. He didn't want all the other stuff that unfortunately went with it well, for him. We're all as seduced by it as, I mean, you know, he wasn't perfect, you know? I mean, you know, we're, we're all, we all want to be, you know, when you work hard, you, you want to connect with people. You yeah. do, and it doesn't yeah. make you a bad person, I don't think, you know? I mean, it's like, yeah, the dream is to, that it's all in service of something larger than any one of us, but I don't, it wasn't lost on, you know, Phil wanted people to like what he did. You know, he thought he was pretty good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you have to have confidence you to do, do it. You and you know, that's to. what this movie, I think, that, but weirdly enough, and this is what I, I would bring to set with me every day, is how strange is somebody that confident would also be that insecure? It is such, and that's what we're talking about with the things being two things, that how could you play, I mean, I love, there's some interviews with Chet Baker that are so interesting. I mean, the one reason why he loved Miles Davis so much and Dizzy and Charlie Parker so much is he, he, would, he would ridicule these people who kind of pretended to improvise. Say, I see this guy play this show, and every time he gets his solo, it's the same damn, it sounds like improv to somebody who well, wasn't here last before. night, right. but the dude is doing it the same way. And what he liked to do is what Miles liked to do is which is throw yourself way out on a limb, play something that doesn't make any sense at all, and then try to make sense out of it. You know, and then try to find, how could you find the melody with two incongruous notes to start out? How can you do that in just to shake? And that's the joy of improvisational jazz, is to find, to find order and chaos, right, in, these, in the math of all of it. And it's really, when somebody does it well, it's really, really beautiful. Have you carried some of that into your acting? I try to, yeah. You know, I mean, in a large way, the Link Letter projects are, are like, they're these kind of, disciplined improvs you know this is like this is a very severe architecture you know take something like boyhood it's like we're going to make a movie about the graph of high school that's what it is it's 12 years everybody's on a graph and i'm going to touch it and but inside that really ridiculous structure i can talk about whatever i want to because i'm actually inside a larger architecture so all this whimsy kind of had, there's an order to it. And so, um, working with him is the most like jazz as an actor. Aside from getting to do stage stuff, like when Shakespeare's really flying, it's, 
it's really interesting that it could feel so spontaneous and liberated, even though it's these ancient lines that are so strong. There's this weird freedom to them that you feel like you're making them up hmm. when it goes well. Well, it seemed like that's what he hoped, you know, yeah. when he wrote it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a couple questions from the audience, but lastly, I wanted to know what is a dream project that you'd love to throw yourself into that you haven't yet? It could be in any medium, any art. My brain is, I love acting so much. And you know, you, you said this thing about how I do other things, and I didn't really answer that question, but it has to do with it. I think all of us like to do lots of different things, and I think it's really good, it's really good for my acting to try to write. I think a lot of actors I've met are wonderful writers. Um, we spend our life around writing, you know? I think directing is a really amazing way to learn about acting. I mean, in a strange way, music, writing, acting have all galvanized for me to teach me more about acting. And as I get older, I get kind of, my dream would be to provide space. You know, if you read Kazan's book, he talks about it, nobody, I've been acting for 30 years, nobody talks, has ever talked to me in a professional landscape has ever talked to me about acting the way Kazan talks. And then people think, is it some kind of coincidence that all these great performances are coming out of his movies? Like he's discovering all these great, he takes it really seriously. He treats it like a spiritual journey, an artistic quest, the same way you know, a, a, a great poet does. You know, it's, it's important. And I haven't had anybody ever talk to me about acting that way. Um, that wasn't in a class-like environment, you know? And, um, and I would love to direct a movie or a play or something and, and, um, and create an atmosphere where people are really thinking about acting in the way that I would find it really exciting. Um, I love this question and I'm so glad someone wrote it down, although they're remaining anonymous. Okay. What roles did It'd be you? fun if I had to guess who it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending on your answers, maybe he or she will show themselves. What role or roles did you pass on that you regret and why? Okay. It's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, that's always a dangerous one because the actor who played the part, you, especially in the time we live in where everybody can go like, you know, this could be on the cover of the post tomorrow when you guys blogs that, you know. Um, one of the funniest ones, because nobody feels sorry for this guy, is one of the, I remember literally, I was driving cross country with a buddy of mine, reading the script to Independence Day, right? And I had been offered the part that Will Smith went on to achieve, you know, international stardom for. And I was reading this to the friend, like as an example of what a piece of shit is. You know what I mean? I, literally, I was like, listen to this, E.T. phone home, ha, what a stupid line, right? And cut to, I'm laughing. I literally threw it out the window of the car. And I thought I was so cool, right? Well, the funny thing is, cut, cut to, nine months later, I'm going out with this girl who lives in Austin. I'm in Austin, and we go to the, it's 4th of July, and everybody wants to go to the movies, and we go see Independence Day, and I think, oh, this will be fun, right? I'll see this thing. And I see Will Smith do all these lines that I was making fun of, and they're hysterical. And the audience is laughing, and I was like, oh, I'm a moron, you know? Like, like, I thought they were a moron, and it's me that's the moron. It's, I just totally, but I also believe that is because I was the wrong actor. Like, I didn't get the joke. You know, I, did, I simply didn't get it. But it's hard to tell a script like that, which can go any direction, that you, I mean, it's a wink and a smile type film, the way it's directed, it's supposed to be fun. I know, and I didn't get that. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, for a long time, I didn't get the idea that anything was supposed to be fun. Uh, and um, so that's one of them. And you know, when I was also, I was very afraid um, when I was younger of, of accents. I had this feeling that I wanted to be true on screen, you know, and that, that, that a fake voice would make me fake. And I, I was really, I didn't, I always thought like I'd be offered some movie and I uh, play an English guy. I'm like, well, there's so many great British actors. Get a British, why, why add this phony layer to the movie? Now they're taking all your jobs, all the British exactly. people. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, and as I've gotten older, I've really started to realize how almost everything 
is an artifice. Everything that we use to define our sense of self, you know, I'm a vegetarian, I like steak, I'm a Marlboro man, I wear, I have clean hands, I'm uh, gay, I'm, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm straight, I'm whatever these things are that, in a lot of ways, <clears throat> they're personalities we try on. <clears throat> And that who we are really is, is far more subtle and complex and nuanced and so conditioned by where we're born and where we're brought up and who's in our lives. And, and that the essence of me is a lot more flexible than I first thought. And that it doesn't necessarily have to be anything dishonest in a different voice. And in fact, this is one of, you know, and, and so in the last few years, I've been experimenting a lot more with it. And... You know, this movie, you know, Chet has a different, he's in a different octave than I am. And so I was really tried to play the whole part in an octave that's, and it changes you and puts you in a different mood. And it's not fake. It's just a different version of me. Um, it's, it's real. And I'm, I've been looking for that more and more. And so I try not to be, so when I was younger, I turned down a lot, any part that had an accent, I turned that down. <laughs> Dude, to go win an Oscar for it or something. And <laughs> felt like a moron. <laughs> And then finally, we have Kay Harrison Sweeney. Where are you? Oh. Yeah! <laughs> hey, buddy! How are you? Good to see you. I knew whoever wrote this would be funny. Um, so, Kay says that he had the pleasure of working with you on Ty West in a Valley of in Violence, Valley of Violence yeah. which just debuted at South by Southwest. With This is a very long card, by the way. Um, Born to be Blue. And on the set of our first conversations involved uh, you telling me to see Boyhood. You are a working phenomenon and have been since you were a kid. What attracts you to a role when it's pitched to you? So we've learned what doesn't attract you. So maybe now we'll flip that. Usually it's a moment, you know, um, in the movie we did together, we did this crazy spaghetti western, you know, it's a little bit half cocked and out of its mind. But I had these monologues to the dog, you know, and I've, I did my first, like one of my first movies was White Fang. And I, I loved acting with this dog, you know, and I learned a lot. See, because dogs don't know they're acting, right? <laughs> and so if you start acting, they get suspect of you, right? Like, you know, haven't, we've all had this experience, like if you're acting with somebody and you can feel how self-conscious they are. They're just thinking about the camera, they're thinking about the thing. And if you do that with a dog, the dog goes like this. You know? And what are you looking at? Like, I, 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 what's going on over here? You know, and, and, and it's a wonderful exercise. If you have a scene with a dog, you have to talk to the dog. You can't give a line reading or something, or they won't know what the hell's going on, right? So you have to say, hello, dog. And, um, and it's really fun, and it forces you. One of the things that's amazing about working with Denzel is that his, he's really big on what his character's inner monologue is, and everything. So you really never know what the hell he's gonna say, right? And, um, and it's amazing as a scene partner, because you have to listen. And once you listen, you're already winning. Already, good things are already happening. Because I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm not preparing my, I mean, he can be really funny. I mean, he can be really tough. You know, there was a, there was a guy we were doing a scene with, and we, it was just a little, a day player. And he did it in a really nice way, but the guy had to say something like, well, the train comes at two, or something like that, right? And Denzel walks up and goes, uh, hey, Hey, buddy. And, uh, and the guy says, the train comes at two. I didn't ask you yet. You know? Oh, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. And he goes, right, so you walk over. And, and Denzel walks up. Morning. <laughs> When's the train come? Train comes at two. You can say good morning to me. You know, if I say good morning. And the guy goes, oh, okay. And comes back. The guy says, When's the train come? Good morning. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm hurting for this guy. And, and, and Denzel, says me, Denzel, Denzel says, I know you've been waiting to say this one line for a month, and I know it's meaning a lot to you right now, but you got to try to be here with me right now. Right? You, you, you know? we got to be here together, because if you're bad in the scene, then I'm going to look like an idiot. You know? And it's true, right? 
And, and it's, it's in, that's what drew me to In the Valley of Violence. First of all, I like doing different kinds of movies. I, I've never been a great shape changer, and I, I like, I find that I can push myself if I'm inside other genres. You know, like, all right, let's make a scary movie. Let's make a Western. Let's do an action adventure. Let's do a romance. Because it helps me expand myself in a framework where I think I can succeed. I remember if, if, if you push yourself too far out of your comfortability, you, the audience is going to really struggle with that, and you're going to struggle to succeed. It's like you have to push yourself. Just keep pressing the edges of the box out. If you jump all the way out of the box, you kind of fall on your ass. And if you're confused, I'm assuming that train scene's not from the Training Day sequel set in the in a country western. No, I western. just worked with them again. Yeah. We That's did it. Sorry, Magnificent Seven, I should have right? said that. Too. We just did a remake <laughs> of the Magnificent Seven, which uh, it's like I don't remember Train and Training Day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think we we would love to hear you talk all day, but sadly we are constricted by time. I love to hear the time. sound of my own voice all day. <laughs> <laughs> we thank, thank you, you for your time. So thank you so Appreciate much. It.